that you know your routine one day, the routine the next day is almost if layers of yourself began to accumulate as sediment in your mind as your routines become more routinized and so on. So he says, when you're an artist, you cannot allow your routines to govern your life. If your life is perfectly routinized, then your life is perfectly stratified. Then there's no, there's no room for expressivity in your life. You always wake up, grab the, 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 the box of cornflakes, serve the cornflakes, read your newspaper, go to, you know, get the subway, go to the work, go to work, wait until from 9 to 5, come back home, make yourself a dinner, and repeat the same thing over and over and over again every day. What kind of art could such a person produce? What kind of philosophy could such a person produce? A very poor philosophy, very poor art, very unexpressive art. And certainly something would be alive, it would be living a life that does not do justice to the potential of the plane of eminence. You are in a steady state attractor. You're simply repeating the same thing over and over. Add, try to add some rhythm to your life at least. Try to add, add some periodic attractors. Try to add some music to your day. So that at least you are now, you know, going to the beat. You know, it might be the same routine. But you are now at least giving a rhythm to your body. Even if it's a periodic attractor. Or even better. Go into a set of practices that are constantly changing, just like a chaotic attractor is in continuous variation. Set your life in continuous variation, which would be exactly the opposite of routine. That by itself is going to start dismantling some of those layers of sediment that routine and habit have put in yourself and open you up a little bit more to the intensities, colors, aromas, sounds, flavors and internal intensities like we've talked about before of love and hatred, of, of joy and sadness, of, 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 of uh, pride and humiliation that are generated within your body, open yourself up to those and try to find a way to destratify those intensities. I mentioned before that Deleuze in Indifference and Repetition explicitly says that a philosopher is in a chapter called The Image of Thought it, it, that a philosopher should always be doing violence to his mind or to her mind. That is, never letting routine, letting, to, letting you go into a place that's too safe, that's too, that, that's too familiar, that's too stratified. So he recommends two things in that chapter. Vertigo, which it never occurred to me, but I think, I think it's interesting. You know, going up in a high, up high building, looking down and letting that kind of feeling, oh my God, you know, if that starts spinning you around, that, that this stratifies you a little, that is not my cup of tea at all. <laughs> but, or, like the friend of my friend says, <laughs> you can try certain magical plants, like mushrooms, peyote, and I can get fired for this, so please don't repeat it, or LSD. Yeah. A, a whole variety of substances that automatically destratify your brain. They take you into a line of flight right away. Under the influence of these drugs, you can look at anything and you find the destratified portions of whatever you're looking at. It is like the, it is sort of as if it was uh, a medicine, because you know it's classified as a drug to make it illegal, but in Pre-Columbian cultures in Mexico, pre-Colombian cultures in Peru, in, in pre-Columbian cultures in, in pre-colonial uh, uh, cultures in many other areas of the world, those plants are used as part of shamanistic rituals to do precisely that. They do it, of course, in a much more careful way than we do. We, you know, take some mushrooms, go to a disco or something. You know, they, they, you know, they, they, they do it at night with candles and everything in silence. You know, they're much more respectful than you people are. <laughs> but nevertheless, it is it is precisely a shamanistic way of getting you in, directly in touch with the plane of eminence. An even better way, although it takes much longer, is to learn certain techniques such as yoga and certain techniques of meditation, which it takes you seven or eight years to ever reach to the point where the little pill will get you in about 15 minutes. But LSD is sort of like the instant rice version of yoga. Just like instant rice doesn't really taste as good as real rice, 
you know, when you, and, and you can freak out in the middle of a trip, oh my god, I'm too distratified, shut <laughs> With yoga, you have trained yourself to allow your own cycle, for instance, the cycle of your breathing, to calm you down. So even, in, even though you can reach similar states of distratification and therefore you can freak out because all of a sudden you start in, entering into a delirium, you have now trained yourself to tap into the, your own rhythms to bring you back into calm, to bring you back into, into a position where you can examine the plane of imminence in a more analytical way, in a more calm way, instead of being freaking out because you're losing your identity and you don't know if you're going to go crazy and you're going to wake up in Bellevue in some padded room somewhere. Everybody that has, trip, has had a bad trip, bad trips are bad. You know, but avoid them. <laughs> That's why they call them bad trips. <laughs> but with some yoga, with some other techniques that have been developed over centuries in certain traditions, you can counteract that. I, I mean, I believe in yoga because as a materialist, I've seen experiments or read about experiments rather in which they put a, a, an expert yoga guy, they put electrodes in his brain, they, they, okay, before you start going down the levels of meditation, let's see what pattern, you know, is in the electro, in, in the phallogram. Uh, okay, now go down one level. The yoga guy goes down one level, the pattern changes. Then go down two levels, the pattern changes. The electro, in the phallogram doesn't lie. The guy is changing the patterns of becoming of his brain in a controlled way. On the other hand, you know, when I look at the Dalai Lama, and, and, and it's, like, the guy is just goofy, isn't he? You know, he's always laughing. You tell him, you know, isn't this a nice blue marker? <laughs> you know, and then he gets his butt kicked out by the Chinese army and stuff like that, and, 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 and his kid, you know, you, you go, well, you know, maybe the Western style of doing things is a little better, you know. Maybe we don't have the kind of calm that the Dalai Lama has, but we are, first of all, less goofy. <laughs> and we at least would protect ourselves if the military would attack us. I don't know. I like the Dalai Lama, but I would not follow him. You know, I'd rather do it the Western way. I've been doing it for a long time. And, uh, yes, I've had really bad freakouts, but... The largest percentage of those trips have been moments where you actually see the plane of immanence on everything, as an immanent vapor, as a something that just floats on top of all the strata, as if, as if by stratifying your crystal, the crystallization that is yourself and removing all those layers of routine, you allow your perception to, in fact, for the first time, make the imperceptible which is that plane of immanence on top of which all the strata are, and which are hiding it com completely, you allow that plane of immanence to emerge and to, and to become visible. The only problem, going back again to, to tripping, is that it is pretty much like a dream. You don't remember everything when you come back. And even if you write it down, your writing looks like totally weird when you come back. It's like, what the hell was that? And even if you record it, Okay, man, now I'm <laughs> <laughs> you know, There's a bird singing. <laughs> I don't know if it's a bird or a dog, though. You know, is it a chihuahua dog? It's a chihuahua dog is coming at me. Oh, no, the chihuahua dog. And then you, you listen to the recording the following day, and you go, I gotta burn this thing. <laughs> you know, you gotta record these things in one of those, like, Mission Impossible the media. You know, like, five minutes, you'll self destruct. Because you don't want your biographer in the future to read those things. It's going to be pretty, pretty embarrassing. Does so it scientifically stay in your spine, or is that what the police market? Well, as a matter of fact, chemically? as a matter of fact, LSD, psilocybin, and uh, uh, mescaline, the three substances we're talking about, come in tiny little quantities into your brain. So there's, it's not as if there was enough of it to to saturate your brain, which means that all they're doing in the tiny amounts is getting, it's like a key that goes into your brain stem, and a few keys attached to certain receptors and then turn. In other words, what they are, what they are facilitating is a state that's